Ladies and gentlemen, good morning. Uh, thank you for coming uh, to this uh, panel discussion on the future of the museum. Um, I'm always very actually surprised that whenever Sotheby's um, has really something, uh, a talk like this, on a weekday, we always get such a nice turnout. Um, and I wonder why you don't have to go to work. <laughs> and I can see Angela Mackay here from FT, she's one of them. But I can guarantee you today, uh, what's going to happen is going to be far more educational, exciting, than for you to go to the office. Um, this is the first uh, ever event held in Hong Kong uh, of this kind by In Other Words. Uh, in Other Words is a very um, insightful newsletter, market analysis, uh, weekly produced by AAP. Art agency partners, the co-founder, one of the co-founders sitting next to me, I'm going to introduce him in greater detail later. Uh, AAP actually helps, uh, is based in New York and also Los Angeles, and actually gives advice to um, top collectors, uh, guidance, you know, how to develop, you know, top class collections. And I think you've also started to advise museums, mm -hmm. uh, patronage, advisory, and you, including how to uh, form new museums. Um, it is actually, the, I think, the two reasons why um, it's a very interest, interesting topic and is, is, is held in, in Hong Kong. Um, I've made two observations. One is that I, um, I think museums, as people of my generation sort of know it, are very different from the museums of today in terms of what they show and how they interact with the audience. Um, then secondly, uh, it's good that this is happening in Hong Kong because I think you agree that Hong Kong being part of Asia, Asia is uh, the, f the fastest museum growth area in the world. Uh, I was looking at some figures the other day. Uh, in China, back in 2006, I think they only had about 1,500 museums. And 2006, uh, that was 100, yeah. And then 2016, over 4,000, wow. although 3,000, or well, thereabout of them were like uh, state museums, but still a phenomenal number. And for Hong Kong, of course, we have uh, the great uh, West Kowloon Cultural District. Uh, I think it's the biggest art project ever since in the history of Hong Kong. Um, so today, um, it's a, it is our great honor to have some very distinguished leading cultural thinkers uh, with us today. Unfortunately, Budi Tak cannot be with us today, uh, but we have the others. Uh, and, and I'm going to introduce them uh, one by one. So they're going to talk about the future of the museum, covering topics from uh, audience engagement, um, collections, etc. Now, the first person that I'm going to introduce is uh, Michael Govan. And I think most of you would know who he is. Uh, he is the um, top guy, the CEO of uh, LACMA, Los Angeles County Museum of Art. Uh, since 2006, it has transformed not only the museum collections, but the way in which um, these collections interact with the audience. Um, he has facilitated new creative interactions between contemporary artists and architects and the museum's historic collections. He's a very busy man. He's in the process of replacing the old structure um, with a totally new state-of-the-art uh, gallery. Uh, and also, I think what is nice is, you know, art is not only for the rich and established. Um, LACMA, under his guidance, is now making uh, lots of collections of art available in um, underserved communities. And I think you are the uh, museum in the U.S. that has the biggest in-school in, in uh, education program. So wonderful. Uh, and then we have uh, Doyun Chong. Before he joined, he's the deputy director and chief creator of Amplus. That needs no introduction. Uh, before joining uh, Amplus, um, uh, uh, Doyen was the associate curator of painting and sculpture of MoMA. And he oversees all curatorial activities, digital initiatives, encompassing design, architecture, moving image, and uh, visual art. And uh, we've been waiting for Amplus for so long, and I'm glad. <laughs> And I'm glad to say that the, uh, your, your new uh, Hatsok uh, building will be um, opening in 2019. Building should be finished in 2019. 
the building should be finished mm -hmm. by 2019. Yeah. Thank you. Mm -hmm. uh, and then Alan Schwarzman, co-founder, one of the co-founders of AAP. Um, he has more than 20 years of experience in advising top, top, top people how to form top, top, top collections, and uh, especially in contemporary art. Um, he is also widely respected as the independent curator for Instituto Inhotem. But the South Americans say Inhotem. In 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 uh, which is an amazing visionary contem contemporary art park set, set in 5,000 acres of, uh, of, in, in, of a Brazilian botanical garden. So, last but uh, not the least, uh, we have uh, Charlotte Burns, who is the uh, chief editor of In Other Words. Uh, she has, her English is much better than mine because she's got first class uh, English degree from Birmingham University and also a, a, a master's degree from Courtauld uh, in yeah. Germany. Um, so she's going to be uh, our moderator today. And uh, I've only been given three minutes uh, to speak, so I'll finish here and I'll hand over the floor to the distinguished speakers. Feel free to ask lots of questions. And now I have to, as CEO of Southeast Asia, I have to go back to the venue to help my clients form distinguished collections. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Thank, Thank you people. so much, Kevin. I wanted to thank, thank Kevin you. and to also thank Sotheby's for hosting us today in our first ever live event and thank my guests for joining me and thank you all for attending. Um, in other words, it's an editorial project that we launched um, by the advisory art agency partners in January last year and it consists of weekly newsletters and podcasts. Our goal was to create a platform for market analysis and articles and podcasts that are at the intersection of markets and museums, as well as host conversations with leading museum directors, artists, dealers, and curators, and collectors. Certain trends have emerged over the year plus in which we've been doing the project, one of which is the willingness of museum directors internationally to really rethink the ways in which they work and collaborate, talking about sharing collections and just innovating new models of working together. And on that note, Budi can't be with us today, but we do have an important announcement from him. So I think we're going to show you a short film. For the last two years, not only ACC that was always on my mind, the second thing on my mind always, how is my legacy? will preserve for the benefit of the world to glory my God because I am a Christian. So this is the second thing that I need to do in my life actually. So I told my family, I said to them that if I share more than a thousand pieces of artworks worth a lot of money shared to a dozens of dozens of people actually means nothing. I would like to group it together to preserve the legacy and actually to keep it forever then it means something to the world because the collections men belong for the world. So this is what I hope today I will announce the agreement in principle that both institutions, LACMA and Youth Foundation, will create a non-profit organization that group, my collection. Thank you very much for this opportunity for, 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 for me to make this, you know, the breaking news. <laughs> so perhaps my 
Michael, you could tell us a little bit more about this new partnership. Uh, yeah, well, it's uh, too bad that Budi is not able to be here to speak more deeply about these ideas. Um, his daughter, Justine, is here, and a lot of the team from Use Museum. Uh, we've been talking for years and just recently working very closely together on this idea uh, that Booty has had, not only to hold the collection together and make mm -hmm. it accessible, but I think to take the idea of a used museum and, and grow it. I, one of the rare things from the moment I spoke with him, um, I, I don't think his idea ever was to control the museum as a private collector, as a space for his private collection, but rather, and this is true in the engagement of um, artistic director Wu Hong in the breadth of exhibitions from Giacometti to contemporary artists that he wanted it to be a public museum. Right. And I think there was a certain frustration actually when we first spoke that he was having trouble navigating how to do that um, in mainland China where really the models have been government museums or very private museums. And so we talked about how the system works in, in the US. In fact, LACMA is the Los Angeles County Museum of Art. We do have some government funding, but um, that's only about 20%. And we're, like most US museums, uh, supported by many sources. We have a board of trustees. We have corporate sponsors. We have individuals. Every work of art in LACMA is a gift from someone or a gift through, um, through someone. And so, the question was, how could we do that? So that was the discussion. And then we started realizing that as we were growing our Chinese collections in Los Angeles, mm -hmm. we just announced yesterday a huge gift from of, uh, Gerard and Dora uh, Cognier of 450 ink paintings, mostly ink paintings. There are also photography and other things that are from mostly from China, but also other parts of Asia. We've been growing our collections and programs that maybe there was a way to use this opportunity to create a little bit of a cultural bridge between Shanghai and Los Angeles, um, between his collection, which yeah. is so strong and, and really does sort of capture the zeitgeist, I think, of a period of time, as does M Plus's collection, but to have more than one, and that to connect that with LACMA's collections, just of international contemporary art, of art, that maybe we could do something new. I, I wish he had said that in the video, and it's clearly because when you hear him say, we're going to make something new, uh, you sense his spirit that I, with which I think he launched use mm -hmm. and uh, wants it to go into the future. So um, the idea is that we would, we're partnering now, I guess he, he, he likens it, uh, um, I think it's fair to say he likened it when talking to me as a, a marriage. So I guess this is the engagement <laughs> announcement, uh, party to follow at some point <laughs> soon. <laughs> and then the idea is to enter into a marriage uh, where, where our responsibilities together would be to preserve the collection, to bring it forward to future generations, and to do that within a program, an exhibition program, um, that would be different, hopefully, from others. I mean, one of the different things about it might be because M Plus is so strong now in building the, really one of the largest museums for contemporary art in all Asia, um, modern contemporary, as we may also play with our historical collections. You can right. take themes that artists are working with and uh, put them into even historical context, working with artists. I mean, I think we want it to be a contemporary-oriented program driven by artists and contemporary art, but our, our historical collections, I mean, artists don't draw a distinction between, and they don't think about contemporary art as a category, they just think about art. Right. And they're artists and they make art. So I, I think there's a, there's a possibility to do something beautiful and new and complementary mm. to other things going on in Asia. So that's our intention to be married soon. <laughs> 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 and, to, uh, and, and together, therefore, in this family to reach out to others for support. I mean, this would be a publicly supported organization by corporations and individuals in China, around the world. Um, and, and to develop something, as Booty likes to say, that would be really new. Why do you all think that collaborations are, are a topic that people are, are thinking about more openly? This is a model that you're creating a new model that didn't, doesn't actually exist right now. Um, why is it in the, in the air? This, people used to be more territorial in thinking about their collections, their distinctiveness, and that kind of proprietorial attitude seems to be shifting a little bit to a more collaborative way of thinking. 
Why is that? Not enough, even. I mean, I think it is hopefully the future. Or we talk a lot about how institutions, you know, why do we have institutions? Because we have to carry things forward. We all die. We need a vessel to hold things beyond us and to gather many people, right? But, but also institutions do become sometimes too proprietary, too boundary laden. And so we talk a lot, I mean, about the, can we make institutions more permeable? Um, and for us, it's something that's very exciting. We just, um, I mean, I think Michael Brand is here at the Getty. We, we, the Maplethorpe Estate, huge estate, was a, something we pursued to share equally. There's no distinction who owns what. It's a sh huge estate of art shared equally between the Getty and LACMA. Um, we just made an arrangement with the Autry Museum in Los, in Los Angeles that is a huge collection of indigenous American and Western art. And our curators, the idea is we will treat the collections, theirs and ours, as one. You know, no special loan forms. If it's not on view and, and to work together. And I, I just think that this finally we're getting to this point where we can really think about collections as a public resource that we share. I think we, we need to drop some of that possessiveness. Right. And, um, and now, you know, with communications and travel and, and the, the change in, in even, you know, geopolitics, it's, it's, uh, there's so many exciting opportunities now uh, to rethink art history. And I think, I mean, I think collaboration is the future of uh, the best use of these resources. Dorian, how much does it inform your thinking about M Plus, which is scheduled to open fully next year? You've been creating this huge museum, which has the potential to be a paradigm-shifting institution mm -hmm. in Asia. That's a lot of opportunity and responsibility. How do, you, um, how do you factor collaboration into that and this idea of creating something that you can share and yep. lead by example? Yep. It, we're certainly thinking about it a lot, um, and it is the 21st century, you know, the museum model as we know it has been around, at least within the modern art museum, at least close to a century, but of course the museums have been around for several centuries, um, so we're totally aware of that, but where M plus is particularly is that we are setting up the foundation, and I don't mean foundation as a legal entity, but really setting the baseline here. Right. The building, as I said um, briefly, that it will be finished in 2019. That's when we can actually move into this very large building of 65,000 square meters, which means that we probably need another year to you know, dry out the concrete and <laughs> sweep the dust and then all of that and then really get acclimated in all ways, then start installing. So we're really looking at 2020 right. uh, for opening to the public. Um, but it's not all about the building. We always set that from the beginning around 2011 when people started joining the team that uh, the museum is already existing, it's already open, we're operating because we have been organizing public programs around Hong Kong and even beyond while also building the collection and um, uh, building the staff that are not only coming from Hong Kong but more than a dozen countries around the world. So I'm saying all of this because we really need to become an institution fully, hardware as well as a software, right. for us to be, um, if not equal, um, worthy and appropriate collaborator for many institutions of different natures and scales. So we have already started conversations with uh, various institutions around the world um, with the idea of collection sharing. And whenever we bring this up, nobody has responded adversely. Everybody's understanding it. So it is definitely in the air. It's, it's the zeitgeist. It's so fascinating because um, it really wasn't the case previously. Alan, you've, you strongly feel that some of the most innovative new museum models are going to be, are taking place and we will see them um, more publicly in the coming years in the, tr in the centers beyond the traditional hubs of mm -hmm. Europe and America. Where do you see the future, the geographical future of the museum? Um, well, we're seeing a lot in Asia and the Middle East. Uh, in all likelihood, we'll see more in Eastern Europe. Um, Latin America will be more limited because just the nature of the, um, of the political and economic states, which are always shifting there. Uh, but I think more to the point is that we have a whole new generation of people collecting art uh, who who come from culturals and, um, 
and vantage points that were never engaged in in this before. And they en some enter with very specific ideas and, and, and goals in why they're pursuing it. And others, as with so many collectors, particularly of contemporary art, they start in whatever arbitrary and individualized ways, and then they, they look for what to do with that. Um, the capacity, I think part of it is that we've been through like a 30, 40 year museum building boom around the world as we've known it, where museums have been. And, and in most instances, we've created um, different versions of a very similar kind of model or collection or exhibition program or patronage system. And, um, and so it's quite natural at a certain point when you have that much proliferation worldwide, um, you're also expanding the, um, the professional system that's there to fulfill it. And then within that, you have people who, who, who function within the traditions and you have people who start thinking of new ways of working. Um, and I think particularly um, the, 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 this, the great number of significant uh, collectors who have emerged um, from areas of new wealth over the last 10 or so years are, first of all, of, in general, of a higher degree of wealth than their comparable um, uh, counterparts in previous generations. Mm -hmm. um, and they more commonly think of collecting either in relation to museum building or um, in having some kind of public presence. And so some seek to do it in a way that is um, that follows a tradition and that is in the manner of what is known. And some are more interested either initially or are open to the possibility of, um, of thinking it through in a different way. And it's, it's most natural that those who are oriented toward thinking it through differently come from cultures where there isn't the same history or lineage. And so what it means to create a place that serves its local population and attracts people from abroad and how that gets communicated um, by necessity, um, if not also by a desire to be innovative, um, has leads in a lot of other directions. So the idea of um, a destination museum is, you just mentioned attracting people from international centers. Mm -hmm. And I know that you know, Michael and Dorian, you, you have to serve local communities. And you also um, want to draw people from other places as well. Alan, obviously, in the creation of In Your Team, you created almost the ultimate destination museum in the heart of Brazil, where you see art in a very different context than the typical white, um, white wall, white cube scenario, where art is situated in an environment that's totally unique. To what extent do you think um, destination museums or museums thinking of themselves as destinations will become more important in terms of the experiences that are created? I think it's uh, central in so much, um, at least innovative thinking about museums. I should say, just as an example, and we're just at the beginning of something. I mean, the, the, the kind of collaboration that you're talking about, we're just at the beginning of possibility. And part of that comes out of um, necessity, either economic or supply. And part of it comes out of a different generation of leaders who who have a different way of looking at art and a different relationship to their peers than maybe in the past. Um, but similarly, um, so, so when you Chin, just to give a little background, was um, there was a collector in Brazil who was collecting contemporary art. He was going from being a small scale collector to a large scale collector. The development of the collection evolved simultaneously to his acquiring a very large piece of property in order to preserve it in an area that was threatened with development. And his idea was simply to make a, um, um, uh, a legacy that he could, that would be meaningful and would bring people to um, this area that he finds so beautiful. He didn't know what that meant or what the possibilities were. And initially, the name of it was uh, Center of Contemporary Art of Inyochin. And so the question then became, why are people going to travel 15 to 20 hours plus to come see what they can see in every major city in the United States and in Western Europe? 
And so we began to evolve an idea of um, a place that would, by necessity, be a destination, not just in terms of a touristic attraction, because at first we had no idea if there would be a public. We thought maybe a few hundred people a week would come. Um, but in terms of opportunity, here was an opportunity to work with artists to enable them to make, to envision ideal kinds of works that they may not have had the opportunity or think they would have the opportunity to pursue, to loc or, and also to acquire very large scale works that are significant, that belong in museums, but are simply not practical due to the cost of real estate and the limitations of space in museums to house permanently. Uh, and to make this a destination for those kinds of works and to situate them in a landscape where how you approach them and what your experience of them is, is amplified by, by the environment and how they're cited. Um, so th th this was a, nat a model that kind of grew through process, mm -hmm. really responding more to artists on the one hand and to a collector patron's desire to do something unique and not quite knowing what the possibilities were for that. Um, uh, ultimately, it's, um, it ends up being a place that uh, cultural visitors from around the world go to. I think virtually every museum group, certainly in Europe and the United States and Latin America that have gone on, um, on culture tours have been there. Many museums have had board meetings there and have come numerous times. But interestingly, the, um, the vast majority of our public is local. They are not people who have a history of going to museums. They have no history or experience with art. They're coming for the botanical garden. And in the process, they engage with art. And they engage with art in a way that is far different from a traditional museum. And because of the nature of the landscape, it is more inviting. It becomes more experiential. And so it's created a kind of gateway that, um, um, that would not um, otherwise have existed before. And that just grew naturally out of the, the given situation within, um, within that area. What you're saying about local communities reminds me of a conversation that I've had with you, Dorian, and you, Michael, two separate questions. Michael, first, you are working towards opening different LACMA campuses in LA. And I remember you saying to me, you could have a different LA, just 10 miles, a different LACMA just 10 miles down the road because you can think of ways in which you serve your communities. Can you talk a little bit more about that idea of thinking locally? Well, yeah, I mean, I guess the title is The Future of Museums. Um, museums. We live within, I think, this definition of museums that is mainly a creation of the 19th century. Mm -hmm. Right, and it's two spectrums of what goes on in the 19th century, and it's it's relevant to modern day Los Angeles. But you have the you have this idea that travel is now happening, and people are writing about travels. So the idea of the world opening up to many cultures, and then at the same time you have the impulse to make a place in a city like a library of all the world. Right, so you have an encyclopedia, and I think that uh, you know that model of the encyclopedia. Then this, in the, certainly in Europe, in the U.S., Europe transformed toward that a little bit. And the U.S., since there were no museums, they all became these ideas of like a box where you put everything. Travel has made it now that we. I think that other aspect of the 19th century, the travel and the sensing of localities, has emerged as increasingly important. So when I imagined making a museum for Dia, Dia Beacon, it was very much about the specifics of a unique place in a locality. Mm -hmm. um, and in fact, the project at LACMA was how could, you apply, how could you apply the idea of the growing importance of locality now that we have the internet and travel and why would you go anywhere if you can see what you can see, you know, you can travel everywhere. Everything has to be special with all the access to information. The experience has to be special, like the gardens are there. And so I said, could you make the experience of the giant encyclopedic museum very special? The metaphor has been the park, mm -hmm. <laughs> the indoor-outdoor, the wandering through. And so we're trying to do that in the main museum. But then what about this idea of a box? Our cities now sprawl so far. It's not for a village anymore. And so that's where we started thinking, well, yeah, you can do branch museums in the world, like we did at the Guggenheim, but what about the fact that there's an entirely different world five miles away or 10 miles away? 
new audience, different audience. And if you had three or four of those in Los Angeles or five big museums, you could, I joke, you could send the show, <laughs> the same show to five locations in LA and it'd be completely different audiences. Mm -hmm. And then how could each one of those be distinguished with a sense of place, of locality? I mean, if you go to East Los Angeles, it would be perfectly appropriate to have a Chinese-centric program because those, it would make sense in those communities as it would make sense to combine the, uh, the, the great migration, African-American traditions and the Latino immigration in South Los Angeles. And so it gets to be very exciting to think about uh, differentiating experiences even within so-called one city or one place um, and, and everything's on the spectrum, right? That as a system, we create art education as a totality. But then the real experience more and more today with access to information being easy has to be special and unique. Um, and I think there is a little bit of a disease or started to be in collecting and collectors and museums that everything started to look the same in contemporary art collections. And I think that's really outmoded. Like, would, why would you travel between San Francisco and Dallas or other cities to see the same contemporary art collection, we really need to differentiate our experiences um, to make them exciting. And so, you know, there's no one answer. You're not going to the local or going to the, to the general, but um, in the playfulness between them, I think, is the future. And Dorian, with M+, um, you're creating a whole new a whole new way of experiencing art for people in Hong Kong. It's going to be the first major museum here. And to some extent, it seems like museums are the missing piece of the puzzle here, that the art market and the gallery scene have developed so dramatically in such a short period of time. Yep. And the museum um, stands to make a great effect. What do you hope that the impact will be locally in Hong Kong, but also in the region? Well, I do always... Uh acknowledge and remind people that uh, Hong Kong has had uh, very strong museums, in fact. Mm -hmm. um, they are all governmental. They are part of the department called Leisure and Culture Services Department. Um, so Hong Kong Museum, Museum of Art that is under uh, renovation and that will reopen again in 2019 that's dedicated to Hong Kong art from traditional to contemporary. There is a museum called the Heritage Museum that looks at culture in general. There's history museums. So I think these museums have been around for decades and they've done great work. Um, they usually don't get the acknowledgement. So uh, you know, I always say that publicly and privately because we are, yes, we are landing like a giant mothership on the waterfront, um, but in fact, we are part of a larger landscape um, in terms of institutions and nonprofits. Speaking of nonprofits, there have been really pioneering smaller uh, institutions in town as well. Asia Art Archive has been very important. They've been around for almost 20 years. Yeah. Parasite as a little Kunstala has been very important. They also have been around for a couple of decades. So this, the scene has been there. It has been modest in terms of its just number, but they have been there. Um, but as you said, certainly the commercial um, gallery um, and auction scene has grown tremendously. Um, but I like to also think of them as not purely commercial entities, but they also have played important educational role for the local public who have not had much opportunity to um, see art. And then it might be, a lot of it might be the same kind of contemporary art that you can see everywhere. But if you haven't seen the local public, like what you were describing, Michael, that you know, East Los Angeles or South Los Angeles, you know, they may not have seen any right. of this art either. So I really think of um, the galleries that have been there and that are coming playing that educational role. And I will also include Art Basel for that. I think Art Basel, I think it is the most attended of the three. I think last year they had 75,000 people coming through during the public days. I think they sold out the tickets like two weeks before the show even opened. So there is great hunger and curiosity to see uh, what contemporary art is. So it's important to understand all of that, 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 that we are not just, yeah, we are filling the gap, um, but it overlaps with uh, other entities existing. that have been doing, yeah, existing entities. We actually, in our current issue of the newsletter, we have detailed all of the, well, not all, but we've, we have a list of the most um, innovative or interesting institutions in Asia, and there's you know, a huge amount happening. 
yeah. as you say, and has yeah. been a huge event happening in Hong Kong. But nonetheless, M Plus will be yeah. really taking things sure. to a new level. Mm. And how do you think about um, what your impact will be locally and beyond that? Right. So building on what I was just saying, what we haven't, uh, what has not existed is a place, an institution that tells. Um, first of all, some kind of a baseline story. If you wanted to know about the history of uh, Chinese contemporary art or Hong Kong art, um, or the Hong Kong Museum has been doing it, um, but these two particular art histories in relation to the regional art history or world art history, there has not been an institution that uh, has been able to do that. So we can certainly play that role among many other things. And you mentioned the market, and on the one hand, the market, and, and this is internationally, this isn't just in Asia, the art market has um, been a major driver of the museum building boom that we've been talking about over the last decade. And on the other hand, the market can be accused of having compromised the museum. What role do you think the market will play in the future of the museum? That's for any of you who I'll take it answer. on. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> no um, comments on that. <laughs> So um, uh, there are people who, let's say, started collecting art in the 1980s. And maybe they put $5 million over time into collecting. And let's say this was someone for whom that was, I'm just making this up, 20% of their wealth. That $5 million, if they did it wisely, um, is probably worth a few hundred million dollars at this point in time. Um, uh, it, the, and this becomes 80, 90% of their net wealth. At the same time, museums are growing and building, and, and um, their collections are getting fuller and fuller. So let's say you're, you're a publicly minded person, you're thinking about your legacy. Um, the likelihood that some of these collectors who are very publicly spirited and believe in giving back to the community start to say, well, there are some who say, OK, this now has become something so much different from what I bought that I have a responsibility to my family, my business, to keep this going. So that shifts some priorities. Then you have others who say, OK, now I have a billion dollar collection. If I'm going to give this to the Museum of Modern Art just to pick one museum, and my collection's rich in Matisse and abstract expressionism and pop art, what's the likelihood that my major masterworks, how many of them are going to get onto the walls with what frequency? And so, the market has, and how it has, um, whether positively or negatively, reframed how people look at works of art. Certainly, when Portrait of Dr. Gachet is put on the wall of a museum, there are more people who go to see it because of the price tag that was associated with it than where it fits in with Van Gogh's work in general. Um, but, um, but, but I think we're seeing a lot more um, rethinking of what long-term patronage means for museums um, and what it means for collectors. So uh, it's natural that as more collect, so there's some collectors whose interests then become in creating their own facility that has their name on it, that, that, that keeps their collection together where they can have control over um, what gets seen and how it gets seen and what percentage gets seen. And then there are others who, who start to think in ways that are maybe more innovative about how um, um, they can be working with public institutions to gain greater profile for their collection in ways that the museums could not afford to do on their own, but actually uh, bring out the best in what the collector has achieved and, and elevates the, the kind of field of what the museum can do because it's now got added facilities. So I look at SF MoMA. And I think that's a fascinating story about how, how the market has, in a sense, been central to how a patron has, has, has evolved what his commitment, long-term commitment, is to the collection and how that um, uh, gets formed in relation to the museum. What used to be seen as a Rubicon of patron here, curator here, is, is changing. And some of it's changing by necessity, and some of it's actually changing by invention. So I think it's, it's a huge changer. I think that so many of um, the new museums that we're seeing in many, maybe just in their infancy of conception uh, in areas of new wealth are directly linked to, um, 
to culture as a larger driver of tourism. And that greater increase is, to some extent, connected to uh, the growth of cultures around the world or the growing awareness of cultures. But a much larger percentage, in all likelihood, is driven by the fact that art has a lot more value. And so it's therefore attracted a lot more wealth. Do either of you have anything to add to that? Any thoughts on the market? That's just, I mean, I don't, we, um, it's funny, the bigger the museum, the bigger the public, the less the market matters. So people come to LACMA, we have 1.56 million visitors. Um, it's funny because often a collector will put a work in that loan a work or be part of a show and because it's very, very valuable, they will expect that more people will look at it. It's usually not the case that the audience for our museum is mostly market blind. It's a mm -hmm. tiny, mm -hmm. tiny fraction of that visitorship that cares at all. And time will be the great leveler of those things mm -hmm. because, you know, art history, history is ruthless in terms of what mm -hmm. it needs to go on. So the bigger you get, the, small, the smaller the impact. Mm -hmm. um, you know, most big collections, there is this constant in history tension between and positive tension between the private collector and the public museum. So a lot of, in the United States certainly, and in Europe, a lot of the public museums are the assembly of private collections, right? Mm -hmm. right? Whether it's the collections of European monarchs, mm -hmm. <laughs> or in the United States, more the robber barons to the um, you know, current new wealth, that the, the collector has the impulse by. They can make a decision in two seconds, they can build this resource, some of it's good, some of it's bad, but there's that energy to it. And then over time it gets assembled into something that sifts and sorts. Um, you see a, new, a whole new generation of private museums. What's really cool about Booty, I think for me, Booty Tech, is that I mean, er, as early as the museum opened three years ago, he was already thinking how it would become a public museum. Right. And I think a lot of private collectors who are doing private museums aren't really thinking about the true implications, and there will be in the future a kind of reckoning mm -hmm. of the fact that there aren't plans mm -hmm. made, that the, the, the collections aren't diverse enough to really carry into the future a long term. And so this partnership is a sort of how do you, how do, you do a little of both, have the energy of the private collector um, with that specific focus and then the, the, the educational long-term infrastructure of a big museum. And that's been a tradition. It's, it's yeah. in, in the history of museums. And I think it's, it's um, you know, there's, there's going to be that constant play between the two. Certainly it's a hard transition for these, I mean, you know, San Francisco is a case where that family was planning to make their yep. own museum until they weren't. Uh, it turned out, I think, good, well, good for the public. And, and so there's some interesting stories there. But, um, you know, the market, just to say, the market is not necessarily good for art museums. Collectors will say, oh, business is booming in the art market. It must be great for you as a museum. I was like, no, it's terrible. Insurance is high. People don't want to lend things. We can't buy things. More and more families, you're saying, it's part of their wealth, so they're less willing to give. So, you know, it's interesting that there's an inverse reaction, there's an inverse relationship sometimes to the art museum, whereas people would be happy to give you things in the old days. Now they're worth so much right. that for Booty Tech to do this is a, it's, it's a giant gesture on a scale that maybe 20 years ago giving your art collection to the public was less um, of a big ask in that sense. And it's also interesting the impact that that might have in terms of him setting precedent for collaborating in that, in that way. Mm. Dorian, do you have any thoughts on the market as well, on the museums? Yeah, you know, the challenges that Michael and Alan were describing, the sort of tension um, or you know, distance uh, between public museums and private collectors, I think we're completely aware of that. But again, we're still in the very beginning build-up stage. That, that's not something that we're experiencing that much uh, yet. And, and, that, and also, we started our whole collecting effort six years ago um, with a great uh, donation that we received from yeah, a private from collector, which is collection. in the Fantastic. scale of 1,500 works, you know, our right gift, which really just launched into a totally different space and provided uh, a major stream um, 
of the narrative that we're going to right. tell as an institution. Now, so that's that, um, but we didn't stop there and we're not a museum of contemporary Chinese art. It's meant to be a, a visual culture museum that is multidisciplinary. It's um, broadly Asian, maybe even global institution. So this is an important stream that that particular donation helps, but we had a lot more to do. So. Again, uh, the developing gallery scene in Hong Kong, as well as Art Basel, have been very, very important uh, uh, source for us to acquire works from. Now, going back to the point that I was making earlier about how they are also playing educational role for the general public who just walk in to see things, but also that's for the growing collector base um, locally and regionally, and that they're getting educated as well. So I think there's also another kind of education that is happening, that they're not only teaching themselves about newest trends as well as art histories, but also what relationships uh, there may be between private collectors and a public institution. You know, none of this has happened. They're all new, we're new, so we're all getting educated together. Um, so, you know, I often feel like, uh, uh, you know, what's exciting about working in this region compared to, um, say, New York, uh, is that uh, you're not changing or reinventing the rules because there aren't really rules established. Right. We're actually just inventing them. And it can be totally yeah. frustrating sometimes and can be unsettling to see certain behaviors that may not be kosher, you know, from the, the perspective of other more established places. But more in general, it's very interesting to see that. So I feel like, but we are a publicly funded museum at this stage, so we have to be the only straight-laced guy in the room, but not completely, you know. We also <laughs> have to be adaptable and flexible because the whole um, context that we're working in is different, yeah. and then the you know, the models and the rules that already exist, which we do take seriously and learn after, uh, but have to be always aware that you can't just apply them directly yeah. here because it just doesn't make sense. We, it's, I mean, it's a really worthy thing. We, we were talking about that when you were in Los Angeles for a little yeah. while, but I, what drew me to Los Angeles was the newness of the of that sort of Pacific focused mm -hmm. thinking that there was going to be more change, more invention um, between the West Coast of the US. Mm -hmm. I think Latin America is going to emerge strongly. Mm -hmm. um, it's such a huge cultural influence in the United mm -hmm. States and mm -hmm. back and forth and what's going on in Asia. So the, I, the exciting part of being in this sphere of the Pacific is not that we know what the future of museums is, but that there are many futures mm -hmm. and it's going to be exciting to find out, and we have no idea. But there, it is, as Dorian's saying, it's all being invented, and right. the, even this idea that of, of booties is all, it's all new, and I think that's kind of, I mean, even being in Hong Kong, it's why it's exciting to be looking at things from this perspective. One other question I wanted to ask you, slightly different, really, is um, with advances in technology, such as augmented reality, comes great change. And in one of our podcasts coming up this week, I interviewed a curator at the Victoria and Albert Museum in London who has been behind the David Bowie exhibition. Mm -hmm. And he said that he's taking a little bit of time off from doing these immersive exhibitions because he wants to really wrap his head around how VR is going to change the way that people experience the museum. And um, to some extent, institutions may fear losing their monopolies on the objects that museums maybe did in the 19th century with the invention of print. But um, museums will also have the ability to grow their audiences in dramatic new ways, whilst individuals can you know, put on a headset and create their own institution. Is, is that something you think about? And Michael, I thought you could speak to this first, given the success of the uh, Inyaritu um, VR work, Kane y Arena, which I know was just at LACMA. Um, well, I want to say it's, it's a spectrum, right, of possibilities. And on one hand, we may indeed be re-entering the age of the plaster cast. <laughs> where you can <laughs> create a virtual environment and copies that have a verisimilitude mm -hmm. of you know, architecture and art, the things sometimes that museums can't do because they have the artifact separate from context. So in one sense, we may be inventing new experiences like that that are trying to copy. 
The other side of that is the specific, is things that are really, truly new. So you're talking about an artwork at LACMA that's by the filmmaker Alejandro Iñárritu, in which it's an entire experience. It's not just virtual reality. You actually start by entering into a room that is cold and uncomfortable, taking off your shoes. Finally, a buzzer goes on after you're properly uncomfortable. You've, uh, you walk in bare feet on sand in an arena about the size of this room. You have goggles, but there's also wind and subwoofers shaking the space, and you're like in the desert somewhere between the United States and Mexico, and you're in an encounter between migrants and US officials. There's also surreal elements to it. And it's an experience for seven minutes unlike anything you've seen. I mean, it's very high advanced in terms of that, but it's also, it has sand. <laughs> you know, it's very tactile too. Mm -hmm. And then at the end of it, you actually are, are, are engaged in videos which are portraits of those people that you experience virtually. Mm -hmm. So what he's doing, and that may be some of the future immediate, is not go home and put on your VR headset and you have everything. It may be a combination of place. And of course, the context is important because you're in an art museum in Los Angeles, uh, in that case, and with other artworks around. Now it's being placed in other places like Mexico City and now Washington, DC. But I think that it's not a simple question and we're gonna see, I mean, we may see you know, educational copies mm -hmm. as in the age of print. But we're also going to see things we can't imagine that combine physical context, location, materiality, and immateriality. And that's where maybe artists are going to take it. Mm. That sort of um, leads, in a way, to my final question before we open it up to the floor, which is uh, one of our guests in one of our pre-discussions said, you know, we talk a lot about the future of the museum, and maybe even more so than we talk about the future of art. And all three of you have built institutions very much bringing, incorporating the visions of artists. Um, when we talk about the future of the museum, let's also think about the way that that impacts the future of art. Um, so when we think about creating new museums, what are we, how are we involving artists in that? How are you thinking? How much are you led by artists? How much do you involve them? And with things like virtual reality, I don't know, where's the future of art within the future of museums? A small question. Yeah. <laughs> you want to start? Dorian's going to tell us. You two are going to listen. Tell us. Okay. No, I, I was, well, I think I, I was going to follow yeah, up uh, <laughs> I was on what Michael was saying. And then, you know, I was just thinking in my head about, um, you know, every time a new form of technology is introduced, then we think that that is going to just change things yeah. completely irreversibly. No, but that's not always It's true, additive, it? usually. Yeah, it's additive, but sometimes also disappears, right? That, um, for instance, television not only changed people's lives, but it also became a very important artistic medium um, from Nam Jun Pak on, obviously, mm -hmm. right? And then it is very much part of the history, part of art history. Um, you know, I was also just thinking about uh, well, internet, I think is a still part of it, but what has it actually done in terms of transforming art itself? I don't think we know that yet, um, but I remember the specific example of now more than 10 years ago when Second Life, the online game, yeah. um, uh, it was introduced and there were a lot of articles about it and not only artists are going to just create artworks there but also the museums are going to have virtual museum branches in Second Life. A few great works have come out of that. Taufei has done an incredible project, mm -hmm. RNB City, that was entirely created in Second Life but Second Life is no more. Mm -hmm. Right? I mean, that has completely disappeared even from our general consciousness. So I kind of wonder um, about that about VR as well. You know, mm -hmm. Is this going to actually stay on and not only change the uh, direction and destiny of art, but also how we perceive and exist in the world? I, don't, I think there is a big question mark still. Um, now, having said that, uh, I, we started out by talking about 21st century museums and collaboration as a very important model for the future of museums. Um, but knowing uh, that this may sound very um, 
conservative and even reactionary. You know, I often just say that what we're doing here is trying to create a 20th century museum because there has never been a 20th century museum mm -hmm. here of this scale with all of this content. So I don't think that model has fundamentally changed. And I like to think that um, much of art making also has not fundamentally changed either, even with the introductions of new technologies with more and more speed. Um, so I would just leave it at that because I don't quite have an answer okay. for it. <laughs> Artists inherently think differently and look at opportunities differently from how you may imagine. Um, certainly when there were the art and technology experiments at LACMA, <laughs> where the idea was that you would pair an advanced artist with, with someone advanced in, in the technological field that what would result would be amazing. And, and part of at least how it has been described to me is that for the most part it was a failure because there really wasn't a communication even though it was a super interesting project. Um, the, the artists do what they do and um, I remember um, conducting a, 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 an interview for a, I was asked to, to um, have several artists who were participating in an exhibition about painting, to talk about painting. And so it ranged from Chuck Close to Richard Prince and, and Christopher Wool. And so the question of, of the death of painting came up you know, for, the, for the fifth decade in a row. And, um, and Chuck's viewpoint was that painting will always be valued culturally because people look to art for an experience that's different from daily life and as a refuge from daily life. Um, and there's a, there's a real validity to that. I think about a project, so yesterday I, had, um, I got together with Doug, Doug Aiken. Whenever I start a new project, he's one of the first people I speak to because he works with technology and he's always thinking in a way that you don't imagine he would be thinking. So a new situation becomes a trigger for how to um, begin to think about how to innovate. So we did a piece with him in Brazil, and the, the premise was at that point, all of his work was in video, and I felt that putting video in the landscape really wouldn't make sense. So the question to Doug at the time was, have you thought about working with technology but not video? And he said, actually I have. I've always had this idea of a piece which I didn't think I'd be able to make, which is actually a very low-tech work but technology permitted a very high contemporary thought as to what it would be. And it's quite simply geological microphones that are driven a few hundred meters into the ground, and turns out the earth makes noises like our bodies do. And it brings the sounds of the earth into the building. And uh, there are many different aspects that, that make this a remarkable artwork part of which is a, it's always changing. It's a 24-hour live feed. It's the world's largest instrument. It brings your mind to the earth, um, not just as a place, but as an organism with, with, with an interior to it. Um, but it's ultimately a very simple technology that made that possible. So artists will always be looking at technologies in different ways. Mm -hmm. There's virtual reality may, may um, enable an artist to think about like I think of Ian Chang and how he's working with advanced technologies. I, I think ultimately, wherever he goes with that, the thinking about what a subject is and how art need not be fixed, it will, will be the more meaningful result than what the technology technically can permit. I'll just say one other thing, which is that um, most people exhibit, experience um, exhibitions indirectly. They, exhibit, they experience in them through the catalogs. So how art lives on or exhibitions or experiences live on beyond the time or the place in which they're experienced, we've only begun in a very um, um, juvenile way to, to explore that. Most museums, oddly enough, they're visual institutions, but they have really bad websites. And it's really hard to go to a museum website and actually see what the exhibition looks like. You can see images of three works, but you can't have that anywhere near the experience of it. So I think particularly with destination museums in new locations, which are thinking about new paradigms of experience and how to reach out to a public, that technology, we've not yet begun 
to explore what the possibilities are. But ultimately, I think it's less about the most advanced technology as it is applying uh, the most creative thinking to the technologies that exist. Yeah. Well, Michael, you reinstigated the art and technology yeah. pro program at LACMA, and it's having, um, I was following one project, the Tavares Strachan project, yeah. where he's working with SpaceX in a really exciting way. And that would be an example, to my mind, of you know an artist having very creative mm -hmm. thoughts and using the available technology, as Alan was saying, to sort of yeah. realize a vision. Yeah, I mean, things are always changing. The art and technology project of old was as important for artists, for example, Robert Irwin and James Terrell's relationship to a perceptual psychologist, mm -hmm. scientist, and how that influenced their work than the object they made, but it had a huge influence. I mean, I think there are two questions. One was the future of art, which is a very big topic, mm. and the future, and the artists in museums. We, we believe a lot in bringing artists into the structure of the museum, whether it's John Baldessari designing our logo or, or an exhibition, and, or we've done that a lot with artists, or um, even the architecture and the space, the gardens, artists design. So I think the artists, there's a lot of potential to bring the artists inside the museum. And then the future of, of art, actually, it is worth saying, though, that media, as you say, do go in and out of fashion. Mm -hmm. um, you know, painting on canvas is not particularly an old tradition. <laughs> and uh, only recently has gotten expensive. Uh, furniture used to be more expensive yeah. not long ago, and even if we're here in Asia, like painting on paper has a longer tradition that seems to be more lasting. So, you know, tapestries aren't worth a fraction of what they were worth in Europe uh, when they were made in the most expensive art. Mm. Uh, we, ha we commissioned uh, artworks for the internet in the 90s, and they're hard to even maintain mm -hmm. because of changing. So, um, image making will not go out of style and sort of experiential um, architectonic structure, experience, environment. But I think the media do have the potential to change a lot. I mean, it is possible that painting on campus would be sort of obsolete as tapestries are at some mm -hmm. point. So that's the open future that's exciting. Mm -hmm. Thank you so much. I'm gonna open it up here if anybody has any questions. I believe there are microphones going around. Um, are there any questions? This gentleman in the middle. Um, <clears throat> thank you all. Um, I think there are, are profound kind of political and social implications to the evolving role of museums. I just wonder how you all are kind of addressing, oh, I'm sorry, there are profound um, political and social implications to the changing role of museums. And I'm curious how you're sort of thinking about those and, and, and your approaches to, to those. The changing potential. environment? Or well, the... the <laughs> the nature of how a museum, the role of the museum within a political environment or a social environment, yeah. and, and how that impacts your thinking. Anybody would like to answer that? Um, I think the question was the, how you think about changing political and social yeah. context. For your I mean, by the way, the environment is always affecting how you think. And uh, we do think of the museum as playing an urgent and important role in a changing, ever-changing society and constantly needs to be listening to its potential future responsibility. Assuming what you've been doing in the past is not always what you can do in the future. The drive to consider putting major artworks in elementary schools and in neighborhoods that wouldn't otherwise have even a museum or an art center is partly that idea, but wait a minute, who are we serving? And if we really want to reflect the diversity of the points of view that make up a crazy city like Los Angeles, then you, maybe you can't even be in one place. And you certainly have to change the entire structure of your collections, what you're collecting, who works for you. Like, we're rethinking everything. And we're rethinking it in the context of, of, of those changing, that changing political social environment, always towards hopefully greater awareness of the possibilities. And so, and I think we are, we even consider ourselves sort of activists, not that we would be, you know, with banners about politics or supporting candidates or points of view, but by the way, the, 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 we're in the midst, M plus, LACMA, this is in the midst of changing people's perspectives about, the, about a worldview, about the nature of culture, history, who matters, um, and so I think that it is, you know, it's absolutely relevant, and, and we don't think of museums as like repositories for precious objects at all. I don't. 
um, and think of it much more as an activist player, um, not advocating for a particular policy issue necessarily, although we like policies that support giving to museums <laughs> <laughs> or public institutions. But I, I think it's really important to think that way. And I'm not sure, and then it's kind of new. You know, usually it's the artists that are activists, if they are, and the museums are supposed to be more conservative and preserving, and I think we've changed that view, and now we feel, most of us, that we play an active role in, cha in actively changing perceptions for the future, rather than cataloging and displaying how those perceptions have changed. Right. I think you have a few paradoxes going. Um, the United States, uh, with the exception of a few places, including Michael and, 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 and what he's just said, that uh, we tend to be um, rapid to self-edit and to anticipate if there's some kind of shift in, in public reaction. I mean, it goes down to quite simply the presence of nudity in art. All of a sudden, if somebody makes issue of a sexually provocative work in a museum in one community, then you have a vast number of other communities that start to think, do we, should we be putting a sign of warning in um, a room where there's a painting of a naked body that may not be sexually provocative, but could perhaps be an issue. So I think there's a, there's a certain natural um, mechanism in the United States to, to always be looking um, um, to try to be defensive and sometimes um, maybe overreacting while at the same time, uh, some of the, the most um, interesting and innovative uh, museum projects that are currently being developed or conceived are in countries that we might think of as more politically complex or incendiary. So in a certain way, um, culture is providing internationally a kind of counterbalance, at least in opportunity and promise. To, um, to intensifying um, political situations. Are there any other questions? This gentleman in the front row. About uh, the idea that some societies succumb to like, political problems and the collections in these societies start to degrade and artworks are stolen, is there a association or something like that with museums around the world that will be focusing on protecting collections around the world where places are mm -hmm. in trouble or something like that? So you're essentially talking about preserving culture in places that aren't able to sustain that. Um, is that something that you think about as part of your roles with your museums? Well, there are a number of organizations. I mean, there's different kinds of, there are architectural monuments being destroyed in wars and there are coalitions, there are specific organizations mm. that are devoted to protecting um, that. I mean, there's always been a role for that in our society. Even, even the United States during World War II would circle cultural monuments not to destroy, <laughs> uh, even if, people were destroyed. Uh, there, so there's an, an active, I think always an active role to protect those things. Collections have to be protected in a different way. Um, um, but no, I, I think it's a loose confederation. There are a few international organizations devoted to um, architectural monuments and physically the preservation. Mm -hmm. um, I think you're at, if you're asking about collections and how you sustain that, no, I don't, I don't know of anything. I, I think that's partly what museums are in business to yeah. do, is to protect those collections from dissipating and, and um, disintegrating. But. Well, I don't either, but I guess there are organizations like CIMAM, which is the International uh, Congress of Modern and Contemporary Museums and Collections. And they start, I, don't, I don't think they go in and rescue or salvage collections that are at risk. But certainly in the uh, recent few years, there have been many discussions about uh, deaccessioning. And then I know that that also happens with the Association of American Museum Directors as well. And then that's a form of risk where collection can be destroyed or dismantled. Um, but going back to the earlier discussion about uh, self-editing or self-censoring or outright censorships, which have been happening all over the world, including the Western world with more frequency, uh, organization like CIMAM has been very actively discussing how 
it can set some uh, protocols or um, processes by which they can serve as a lobbying group to help to go in and help the museums that are facing such experience. And you know, we really saw a very explosive example, for instance, when there was a big Chinese contemporary art survey show at the Guggenheim, and it uh, had to pull out some certain works from outside pressure, all mm -hmm. virtually generated almost. It was all on the internet. So, you know, this kind of discussions have been happening, and then there are certainly organizations that are thinking about that form of threats that are facing museums more and more. Yes. Are there any other questions? In that case, I think I will thank my panelists, our guests, for being here. Thank you so much for taking part. It's been really interesting. And thank you all for coming. Thank you. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you.